Okay, Jordan, why don't we get started? All right, so on behalf of uh, Quantum Family Offices and Quantum Business Law, I wanted to extend a warm welcome to all of you. and Thank you very much for making yourselves available to join us on our program today. And uh, we're going to be speaking on this a variety of issues. Uh, the title of the program is uh, Critical Tax and Estate Planning Issues for Business Owners in 2023. And so uh, firstly, I wanted to uh, introduce the three speakers that uh, will be uh, presenting this program. So firstly, we have uh, Todd Louie, who serves as a senior partner of, uh, of Quantum Business Law, as well as uh, Quantum Family Offices. And so for the last uh, 20 years or so, Todd has uh, been speaking to a variety of bodies, um, such as uh, the Ontario uh, CPA Association, the Ontario uh, Bar Association, and, uh, and many other uh, groups on complicated uh, tax issues, both here in Canada, as well as uh, international um, tax planning areas. And um, secondly, I wanted to introduce Andy Yip, who is a senior associate with Quantum Business Law. And uh, he's an experienced tax lawyer specializing in corporate reorganizations, as well as uh, cross-border tax planning. And um, then uh, lastly, I wanted to introduce myself. And so uh, I'm Jordan. I am a, a client services director with uh, Quantum Family Offices and I mainly specialize in financial services and estate planning. And um, I just wanted to introduce the topics that we'll be discussing today. So we'll be highlighting some new tax changes that are, that are taking effect later on in 2023. And we'll be speaking about how they could affect your businesses, as well as personal assets, potentially in some circumstances. Um, secondly, we'll be touching on issues within capital gains tax planning, and we'll be discussing various structures that uh, may be able to help reduce tax liabilities as your company grows, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, liabilities on, uh, on personal assets as well. Um, third, we'll be discussing strategies to be able to provide asset protection, yeah, both for business assets that we have, as well as, uh, as well as personal assets. Fourth, we'll be talking about uh, different structures that can be used for effective life insurance planning and how life insurance fits within conventional tax and estate planning strategies. And fifth, if we have time, we'll be discussing um, different structures that can facilitate um, low capital cost lending for multi-residential real estate. Uh, maybe I'll take it from here, Jordan, if you don't mind. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me, you know, when I seen this agenda is that I think that most tax preparers nowadays are a little bit bewildered and possibly feeling quite apprehensive about the uh, mandatory reporting requirements. Um, of course, whenever there's any new legislation that comes into effect, there's always some concern about, you know, first of all, how CRA will adjudicate uh, whether or not it will be enforced. Like I think of certain things that have happened in the past, you know, such as the purpose test, where potentially dividends that are paid from an operating company up into, a, say, a holding company uh, could in fact be subject to uh, become a taxable capital gain instead of a tax-free dividend uh, in certain cases where there's a purpose uh, that was intended to um, reduce the fair market value of the shares of an underlying subsidiary or perhaps increase the tax cost. Well, one of the arguments that a lot of people have been debating over the last dozen or so, I think it's been a dozen years, I'm not even sure, you know, is whether or not the purpose is the same as the result. Well, certainly it's not. You might have a purpose to achieve something and the result could be very different. So I think that at the end of the day, when we look at the, these types of planning, we look at GAR, we look at, you know, uh, anti-avoidance rules and how uh, we can run afoul of, of these things at times. It's always very important to consider a few important factors. And that is, number one, uh, is what we're doing, is it uh, a, is there a bona fide purpose other than saving tax? Is it artificial? Right? Is, it a, is it too good to be true scheme? Will you receive a massive tax deduction for a relatively small amount of money? Well, I think common sense needs to prevail. So at the end of the day, I think it's also important to understand that you know, where uh, CRA takes an adverse position and there's a negative assessment, well, they fortunately don't have the last say. Over the last uh, few years, we've seen, you know, certain issues with the way that CRA adjudicates claims we've had some issues with. Uh, one of the things we're seeing more recently 
is CRA um, in audit situations sending uh, proposal letters that are threatening gross negligence penalties in instances where a taxpayer disagrees with CRA. <laughs> well, that's not to be tolerated. So if that's happening, well, certainly that is not the intent of gross negligence. They're from the most egregious uh, examples of, um, you know, not only willful blindness, but also an intent to, well, willful blindness can be included, but I'm, I'm gonna say an intent to achieve a tax advantage through, you know, I'm gonna say a, uh, an unscrupulous uh, and, and uh, uh, deliberate way of, uh, of avoiding tax. And, uh, a gross negligence penalty should never be used in CRA's hands as a weapon in order to convince taxpayers they shouldn't claim certain benefits or they should take a position that they don't. So I'm gonna say that we're in a very peculiar time right now and that we've got you know, several different areas that need to be addressed and that um, a lot of the lawyers and accountants and attendants uh, over the through our programs over the last few years uh, have expressed uh, a, a lot of uneasiness okay and, and a certain amount of um, apprehension so maybe Jordan let's go into those slides and let's talk about that for a little bit about some of these issues there's really three things I mean there's reportable transactions there's notifiable transactions and there's uncertain transactions well tell you the truth the third one makes me the most concerned, <laughs> but uh, what is an uncertain transaction where there's a, a benefit where the outcome would be uncertain? I mean, who's to say? I mean, you can do everything 100% by the book and you might have someone at CRA that disagrees with it. You might say, well, that's uncertain. Well, is a deduction uncertain? Well, it depends on the deduction. So I, I think going one step at a time might make a little bit of sense, but maybe Andy, I'll give you this to address this whole issue of uh, mandatory reporting rules and how they've changed a little bit. Why don't you take a run at it? Sure, thank you, Dad. Uh, I guess the first topic we'll cover are the, uh, is the reportable transactions. So uh, currently a transaction only becomes a reportable transaction when two out of three generic hallmarks apply, namely the contingent fee arrangements uh, or co confidential protection or contractual protection. Uh, so under the new rules uh, or new proposed rules, uh, they would cause a transaction to become reportable if any one of the three hallmarks applies. So, and re the reportable transaction have to be reported within 45 days when the transaction is entered into or contractually ob obligated to enter into. Um, the reportable obligations uh, will also extend from not only the parties for the transaction, which is at, at uh, the current legislation, but they will also extend to include promoters, advisors, and person who receive the fee with uh, respect to the transaction. So currently only one party reporting the reportable transaction would suffice, but under the new rules, everyone would have to do the, their own filing. Yeah. Jordan, maybe you could display the next slide. That would be uh, not a bad idea. <clears throat> um, the next slide, um, go down a couple more. Um, so the, the three uh, hallmarks, and Andy mentioned this, uh, articulated very well. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> you know, uh, things to think about. And of course, we run through them fast. We want everybody to graft them. And, you know, essentially, you know, one of the things with reportable transactions deals with uh, whether there's a contingency fee arrangement and whether or not fee that's paid to an advisor would hinge on or depend upon a certain tax result. And then, of course, the other two uh, confidentiality agreements. Well, the primary issue is, is that individuals are concerned, you know, about uh, the minister um, being aware of this. And I think that's the most likely place where that would apply. And then a contractual protection. In other words, well, if I don't receive a large tax deduction, well, then you'll refund my feedback to me as an example. So those are the three hallmarks. And of course, uh, having it reduced to one uh, creates some concern. And also in the context of scientific research and experimental development, there's al already a requirement for uh, reporting for contingency fees that's actually filed on the form T661, on the form that's filed with scientific research tax credits. So um, that's existed for a few years now, but I mean, in reality, um, is this a big concern? Well, it might be, but anyway, let's, uh, let's uh, keep that in mind and let's go on to the next uh, type of transaction, Jordan. Next slide. 
So we're still on protect, uh, pro uh, reportable transactions. Uh, essentially, um, the issue here we've, we've described, so let's continue to move on to the next one, yeah? And, and, and okay, uncertain transactions, the last one. So we'll just go back one. And as Jordan's going back one slide, I'll just say that this area in particular, uh, I think is subject to change. CRA has published some examples of where this applies. Now, I guess the redeeming factor of the silver lining of the cloud is we're dealing with companies that have over $50 million of assets. Well, um, it's quite likely that this uh, will eventually uh, be used on a broader scale for all companies. So right now it's uh, being uh, applied to a very narrow range of companies uh, that have over $50 million of assets, but I think it may be um, worthwhile to consider the kind of planning we're doing. And you know, one of the things that I always maintain, if you're a, 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 a you know advising on taxation or corporate structures or corporate governance or corporate structures of any kind, one of the things that I've always advised is that if you're advising the client, well, you know, just pretend that there's another person in the room with you, and that would be someone from CRA. And if you always give your advice based on that concept, then I think you'll have a lot less to worry about when it comes to reporting certain kinds of transactions. All right, so let's move on from that point, Jordan. You can change the slide, right? So uh, trusts, okay, so essentially a trust is deemed to dispose of its assets every 21 years. And this is a huge point. I'm gonna have you know, Andy touch on this again in a minute, but before I do, I'm gonna say that those of you that have trusts that are nearing 21 years, whether it's 12, 13, 15, 17 years, whatever it happens to be, um, you need to pay, pay very close attention to the 21 year disposition rule, because if you fail to, act to do anything and you happen to have, say, shares of a company that uh, would be uh, disposed of, well, you're gonna end up paying a lot of tax. And many times we've seen individuals that fall into that trap and no one ever told them and their advisors perhaps didn't even know themselves that there's a requirement to affect some kind of a rollout. Now you can do a rollout of a trust uh, to other entities to beneficiaries um, prior to the 21 years, but you don't wanna wait 20 years. So Andy, maybe we'll have you describe how the uh, mandatory reporting rules, give us the, kind of, give us the examples or three. So tell us about the, uh, how they apply to trusts, please. Sure, before I start, just to preface that, uh, this would be uh, with regards to another subject, but well, basically is regarding all the fiber transactions. So under the new rules, uh, there are mandatory reporting applying to transactions or series of transactions that the Minister of, National, Minister of National Revenue designate as notifiable or substantially similar to a notifiable transaction. Um, so one of the examples uh, given was uh, transactions that would circumvent the 21 year deemed disposition rule for, for trusts. So here, the first example we have um, would be distributing to a corporate beneficiary, which is owned by another trust essentially uh, bypassing the 21 year the disposition rule for that distribution. Uh, if you can move to the next slide. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The, the, second, for the second example given is a distribution from a trust to a Canadian resident corporation, uh, corporate beneficiary that is owned by one or more non-resident beneficiaries. And the last example, if we can move one slide, uh, it will be a Canadian corporation paying a tax-free dividend uh, to a Section 112 through a Canadian trust into another Canadian corporation, which is owned by another trust. Yeah, yeah. These, these, so these are three things, uh, interestingly, um, sound as though they're rather limiting. But at the end of the day, there's right the right way and the wrong way to do everything. So if you have a 21 year period that you're facing and you're looking at, oh, what's gonna happen in 21 years? I have to pay all this tax. I wanna look at doing planning. Well, there's legitimate transactions that can be, uh, that can take place such as a refreeze. So uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the terminology I'm using, I don't wanna lose you. So what I will say is, is that essentially you have to think of the state freeze 
as just a way of freezing the value in your own hands so that when you die of a deemed disposition, well, you don't want to pay a lot of taxes. Your state will have to pay significant taxes. So in order to avoid uh, this huge tax bite at death or when the company is sold, it's always wise to look at uh, reorganizing the share capital of your company in a fashion that would, would allow you to be able to exchange whatever shares you happen to have now, and let's just say they're common shares, to exchange them for frozen shares or preferred shares, right? And, and that essentially is how an estate freeze works. And when you do that kind of planning, well, it's often the case that you set up a family trust. And of course, a family trust is more or less um, a way that you can achieve intergenerational wealth transfer by having family members, such as children and grandchildren, spouses, in some situations subject to limitations. But you've got to be very careful there too, you see, because there's um, spousal attribution rules in 74.4 that mean that in certain instances, it's not necessarily wise to have a spouse as a beneficiary. And someone said, well, why couldn't I have my spouse? Well, you can, you can take care of, um, of uh, you know, how assets can be commuted to a spouse in a lot of different ways, but it, it's very wise to really make sure that you're looking at all these issues. Uh, often we see trusts that are done badly. We see situations where, you know, the same person is a trustee, the, the uh, settler and the beneficiary. <laughs> or we, you know, the other thing we see is, you know, trusts that are set up in a way that cause a great deal of concern uh, from a self-dealing point of view. So as an example, you know, John Smith is the trustee and the beneficiary, um, and there's other beneficiaries. Well, CRA could very easily take a position but since it's a fully discretionary trust, John could essentially repatriate everything back to himself as a beneficiary of the trust at the exclusion of other beneficiaries. So that could essentially reverse the state freeze. So what I would say, if you have a successful business that's growing, um, don't let anyone tell you that you're too young to do an estate freeze, that your company's too small, your revenues aren't high enough, you don't have enough assets, your kids are too young or anything else. If you have a growing company that's likely to result in, uh, you know, a large capital gain at death, it's only you and your family that would uh, be jeopardized by not looking at doing an estate freeze. An estate freeze essentially allows you to uh, defer all the tax for a full generation. So how is how is it that uh, a person's uh, kids are too young? How is it that uh, the um, company doesn't have the value? Um, knowing how to navigate these rules are, are very, very important. So uh, what I, we often see, we see lots and lots of situations where estate freezes are done, accountant who's well-meaning, writes a planning memo, memo, sends it to the corporate lawyer who, you know, drafts the trust and does the, you know, share ex exchange agreements and so on. And you end up with a situation where, Nobody thought about the spousal attribution rules or situation perhaps for some of these new reporting rules, you could actually run a, run a foul up without being aware of. So it's uh, very, very important that uh, whoever is involved with an estate freeze has this granular understanding with some of these more central issues toward the law of trusts, toward uh, you know beneficiary designations, toward purification of companies. Uh, we see a lot of situations where companies are being frozen but not purified. We see a ton, of, we see, have one company that 80 million cash still sitting in the company after the estate freeze, right? So the point is, is, is that um, it, it's just not uh, uh, very effective. Uh, then you, know, you have to go and do the whole thing again. And, and the cost to the taxpayer is, uh, it does nothing is a million dollars of um, lost capital gains exemption or so per shareholder or 250,000 in tax per individual. Well, that's a very, very costly thing. So at the end of the day, uh, we're talking about, you know, assisting to navigate a very winding road and making sure that we're not running into trouble. And unfortunately, these rules do change. <laughs> so um, that's it. So we'd suggest that, uh, you know, through, the, through, the, through a family office kind of an arrangement, and whether you have a single family office or it's a multiple family office, um, with, with quantum, the way that we tend to do things is we tend to be, believe in, in uh, sort of collaborating with all the advisors. We, we have sense act as a hub and 
you know, believe that it's really important that, you know, with things as simple as the year end meeting with the accountant, will somebody be there to, to say, well, what about those uh, loans to uh, related parties? Shouldn't they be cleaned up? Well, how do we clean them up? We don't have any liquidity to clean them up. We well, don't need liquidity to clean up loans. You can do it through a number of different other ways. You can pay dividends in kinds of, of, uh, of um, amounts that are loans. You can do single wing butterflies. There's lots of different things that can be done and none of them are accounting by the way. So the, the whole problem is if you're you know, an accountant, you're probably expected to have the answers. So the answers are, are here, they're available. So it's not as you can't uh, outside of your reach necessarily, or maybe you, you do have that sophistication in house and that's fantastic. I'm really talking about situations where accountants might may not have that degree of awareness of some of these issues. And often we're dealing with um, tax law, which again is outside of uh, the line of trusts. And it's not necessarily so that because uh, a lawyer who drafts trusts, uh, you know, does it often, that he's you know necessarily considering some of the areas that are very nuanced. So we're asking for people to be really careful. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Right. Good. And so, I mean, before we move on, do we want to talk a little bit as well, just about the T three requirements then? Uh, Andy, sure. go ahead. Cover that. Yeah. Um. Sure. Thank you, Todd. Um. <clears throat> so the new trust reporting rules, uh, which I'm sure a lot of accountants uh, <laughs> were worried about, the effective date is to be applied to for trust with year ends ending on or after December thirty first, uh, twenty twenty three. So after this year trust will have to start reporting uh, filing T3s regardless whether it made uh, has any taxes payable or it made any distribution to any beneficiaries. Um, also under the new rules, personal information on the trustees, uh, beneficiaries, settlers, or other persons that are not currently required to be reported, such as uh, protectors, will have to be reported to the CRA. Um, also, currently there are no uh, reporting requirement for uh, Bear trust, uh, that, that would change as well. Um, also, the rules will require filing of T3s for express trust. So trust uh, formed by, let's say, um, a trustee instead of a constructive or a constructive trust. The resident in Canada, even though it does not have any income to report, um, if uh, there are non-resident beneficiaries. Um, also, those, oh, sorry, Andy. Oh, no worries. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. no, I was just going to mention that uh, most likely the tax, taxpayer identification numbers, such as SIN number, will also have to be reported for each party of the trust. I think it's a, a little bit disconcerting, you know, the fact that uh, you have to report all members. Of, there's many very practical reasons for, you know, um, and I think it's to some extent a breach of privacy, but I don't think we're about to change that. In reality, it makes sense for family members to be beneficiaries of trust, and perhaps they themselves not know. But, well, of course, the requirement isn't that you tell the beneficiary, but the requirement is that you declare who parties to a trust are and for confidentiality reasons that are unrelated to, you know, uh, tax avoidance and you know and other unsightly things. Um, individuals end up, um, you know, setting up trusts and. Uh, the most, I guess, one of the most common ones I would think of, which, as Andy pointed out, doesn't apply, would be a bare trust arrangement for, say, real estate transactions. Um, for, I would say equally as legitimate, uh, express trusts often use um, planning techniques that are, you know, really intended to, you know, take care of a lot of non-tax needs, if you will. I say non-tax, but somehow those tentacles of tax reach into all these other areas, don't they? So I don't know that it's completely non-tax at all. But nonetheless, it is what it is. You have to file the T3. You've got to declare all parties to the, to the trust and it has to be done wherever you have over uh, 50,000 of assets within a trust. So that's, that's the, the, and for year endings after, is it, is it March, 2023, Andy, is that right? Uh, December 31st, 2020. Oh, December, December 31st, 2023. Thank you, yeah, that's correct. There it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, I also mentioned that there are some exceptions to the trust reporting rules uh, for some more trusts that have existed less than three months, uh, trusts that held, holds less than few less than fifty thousand dollars in fair market value, 
uh, like mutual fund trust, segregated trust, uh, also like graduate rate estates and some qualified disability trusts are also exempt from this requirement. Great, okay, Let, let's talk about these, um, you know, international uh, tax reform regulations that have been brought about by the OECD and the G20 countries. So as we know that over 130 some odd countries have adopted uh, these, uh, this two pillar approach uh, to, um, you know, in order to ensure that various different jurisdictions get their fair share of the taxes of the work. So the, um, as far as the first pillar is concerned, we're talking about companies with revenues of over $20 billion on a consolidated basis. And again, I'll go back to my previous comment. You know, if your company uh, isn't in these categories, well, that doesn't mean that these rules aren't coming your way. So I think it's really useful to see how the way, the way that CRA is, you know, going about adjudicating these things and to see the way that, well, not CRA, I'm sorry, we're talking about, you know, OECD countries, over 130 of them. But CRA also follows these, right, these uh, OECD guidelines as a member of the OECD as well, the Canada, as being Canada as a member. So the issue here would be that uh, where there are transactions that take place, it's based on the location of the end users. So I think the companies that are seeing the biggest impact are companies, you know, such as uh, Amazon or, you know, Wayfair or uh, these other companies that, that sell goods in various different jurisdictions. Now they have to look at starting to pay tax in the jurisdiction where they're selling into. So for, for all companies that look to sell things and sell their goods or services outside of their home jurisdiction, I think that's uh, probably something that will become a reality. I'm not sure when, but I, my belief is it will. Uh, the second tier is there's lots of tax planning that's been going on. And it says 750K, that's a mistake. Our humble apologies. It should say 750 million euros. Okay, so again, it deals with companies that have larger revenues, and it's a 15% tax. No matter what, what country you're, you're in, OECD countries are, uh, are following this. And there's kind of, I think of you know, uh, countries that have tax of less than 5%. So this will sort of greatly affect a lot of these companies. I think uh, can have implications uh, for everyone down the road. So um, let's keep that in mind. Uh, Jordan, what else do we have here on our agenda? Let's keep so, going. We'll be discussing the new substantive uh, Canadian ah. Corporation corporation rules. Yeah, this is a big subject. Uh, so, you know, over the years, I think, you know, all of you who have been on our programs have heard my criticism of certain kinds of planning. I always believe that there's a certain type of planning that shouldn't be done. And I have been very outspoken on the issue of artificiality and why I believe that continuances of companies into other jurisdictions on the pretense that they're a foreign company when in reality they're not. Well, it's, uh, it's rather unfortunate that uh, the planning has been done to begin with. That's my, my view. So. Um, and of course, I did predict long before CRA started to, uh, a few years ago at the annual tax foundation, they announced they were going to be cracking down on such structures. Well, we were providing solutions that were not artificial. And it was my prediction that that would happen. And of course, um, history bears out that uh, it did. So um, this is an area that um, I think we have to be very, very aware of. So if a company is controlled directly or indirectly in any manner, by one or more person who's a Canadian resident, well, then that company is deemed to be what's called a Canadian, uh, uh, sorry, a substantive CCPC. Maybe just look at the rules real quick there, just to make it real clear. I want to make, want everybody to understand uh, precisely the reason that this has been going on. It's very, very popular. I've had accounting firms call me up and say, you know, we've got at least, you know, a dozen clients that have these continuances in the BVI or into, you know, um, into Delaware, and we don't have a solution. Well, there actually was and is, and we'll talk a little bit about it, but I need everyone to understand the reasons. Well, a Canadian controlled private corporation has some benefits, um, has a lifetime capital gains exemption, okay? It's got a, a quali uh, the, um, it's got um, small business deduction. It's got uh, enhanced benefits if you're applying for scientific research tax credits, where you're able to 
get refundability, plus you get a higher rate, call it enhanced rate. Well, one disadvantage is it's uh, these CCPCs are subject to refundable tax, the surtax that causes tax on passive income to be about double, right? So rather than paying, say, 26.5% tax on passive income, well, you're paying over 50%. In the province of Ontario, it's 50.17%. So by taking your company and putting it over, over into Delaware and putting in Canadian shareholders at the top, well, you really haven't done anything. The common law principle of uh, controlling mind and management prevails. You still really control that company, whether it happens to be a foreign company or not, it holds the shares of your company here in Ontario, but you're doing something that you shouldn't have done. That's it. doesn't get any more complicated than that. So let's go on to the next one. So the non-CCPC, really what we're talking about is a company that's controlled by a Canadian company, but it's controlled by entities outside of Canada. And of course, the benefit is clear. There's a no refundable tax. You're not paying that higher rate, the 50.17%. And the, uh, the, the fact is, is that you're paying only 26.5% on passive income, okay? So there are disadvantages. So uh, if you are doing planning that results in your company having a, being a non-CCPC, just remember that you don't have the small business deduction, capital gains exemption is gone, and you have a lower rate of refundability, sorry, lower rate of benefit on ITCs, investment tax credits, right? Not input tax credits like uh, HST, investment tax credits, like SRNED. So scientific research. So uh, of course you, you get, uh, you lose out on the refundability as well. So this is a very um, important issue. I mean, a lot of nuances and we've seen people fall into all kinds of traps. We've seen people actually in scientific research getting a million dollars a year, they make changes to their company. Next thing you know, for whatever reason, maybe it's because they don't, you know, they, they uh, don't bonus down to, to the right limit. They go they exceed limits when it comes to reportable income and they're just missing the boat. So that's it. So what happens, CRA can look at what you've done and they can say, well, this is the substantive CCPT. <laughs> and it's the, you get the, the worst of, of both worlds, not the best of worst, but both worlds, but the worst, right? So you don't get a small business deduction. Capital gains exemption is gone. Refundability, no, nope, you don't get that. You don't. You have to pay the refundable tax. Refundability for the research is gone too. So that's it. So you get really disadvantaged. All the things you're attempting to achieve kind of just, you know, don't work out for you, right? So it's very, very important for that. Um, do we have another slide on this? If not, I'll just elaborate a bit more on this. Uh, uh, yeah, we've actually finished all the slides on substantive. substantive. Oh, did we? Okay, all right. So look, here, here's the reality, okay? So if you're concerned about whether or not you're going to run into trouble here with having a company that is uh, a substantive CCPC, well, uh, there are certain things that can be done to ensure that, you know, uh, you won't run afoul of this. And I'm going to say that... It, it boils down to what I said a few minutes ago, and that is legitimacy. Uh, you don't want to be doing artificial um, planning. You don't want to be basing what you're doing on false pretenses. Uh, you don't have any clients in Delaware. You don't have any employees there. Um, you don't. You don't have uh, even you know uh, office space there. The only reason you're doing it is because you want to save tax. Same with BVI or any other place that you've done continuances in. So to the extent that you're looking to make an improvement in your structure, what do you really want to achieve? What I said a while ago was that you have to consider what the bona fide purpose is. And if the bona fide purpose is to create asset protection, well, then you have a very legitimate reason in some cases for considering options such as Barbados, uh, Wyoming, Nebraska, Alaska, you know, other jurisdictions outside of Canada, because now you're doing something that, that makes sense, that you're doing because you need to protect assets. And protecting assets is a part of our presentation today, part of one of the things we want to talk about. So to, to the extent that, uh, you know, you're doing, you know, say an estate freeze and you set up a trust, well, don't be greedy, It's my first advice. Don't attempt to take advantage of lower tax rates in other jurisdictions. So by having a company that's paying tax in Canada, that's filing a Canadian tax return, and if you happen to be using a trust as an instrument 
outside of Canada because of the more favorable laws they have. So as an example, the more favorable laws that I'd be referring to is the statute of Elizabeth that we have in Canada that has the effect that if you attempt to hinder, delay, or defraud a creditor, a court can make an award having the effect of possibly breaking a trust, although it doesn't happen often, uh, piercing a corporate veil. Section 160 of the Income Tax Act is something we have to be very, very careful of. And that's where CRA can you know, sort of reach through from one corporation, other pull back dividends that have been paid from into one company. So a lot of different things you want to be worrying about. And uh, at the end of the day, um, one of the things that I'm suggesting about Canada that is not necessarily favorable is the fact that we not only have bad legislation for asset protection uh, that goes back to the 1600s, but we also have very poor case law. So uh, this, this case that we've talked about before, Ottawa Weinvolts versus McGuire, where this individual McGuire had set up a tavern after things started to go badly for him, moved assets to his trust and the Supreme Court of Canada rendered a decision having the effect that um, to, uh, of creating law that is very problematic. So what I mean by that is, is that the Supreme Court of Canada stated that McGuire should, should not only have been considering who his existing creditors are, he also ought to have been considering who his future creditors are. So therefore, one of the things that you need to be really concerned about, context of, of asset protection, you know, is, you know, whether or not you're in a jurisdiction that has legislation that would require you to consider future creditors. Simple as that. Who on God's earth are they? Well, I'm going to tell you that they're, uh, for those of you who believe you're invincible because you've never been sued, uh, I'd suggest that you spend an afternoon at uh, the Superior Court and listen to case after case uh, of situations where people are sued for all kinds of things and, uh, or read the newspaper or go on the internet or do whatever you have to do because that's something I, that a lot of people have a false sense of security over that they feel they'll never get sued. It could be employment law issue, it could be customer that is uh, unhappy with you, it could be a shareholder dispute, it could be a marital dispute. Well, there's too many to mention. Okay, it could be you know a liability claim for many, many reasons. Um, so I'm just suggesting that it's probably wise to consider how you can create better asset protection. Now, through the process of utilizing a corporate beneficiary or perhaps a private trust company under Wyoming law, well, you, you've actually established a, a structure that does provide for control of those assets outside of Canada. And the individuals in Canada, well, there would be typically a committee of protectors and a, a letter of wishes is generally what's created in uh, these international trusts. And essentially what they do is they do not create direct or indirect control. What they create is accountability. Yeah. So in other words, the role of a trustee is to administer, administer the assets of the trust. And they happen to be shares of a company, perhaps shares of a company in, in Canada. And that in itself doesn't mean they have directional control. They have what I would call de jure control, control of law of those controlling shares of the company, but the act of operational control of the company itself would be in the hands of the directors of the company, companies in Canada. So you see, what we're really talking about is if the you know, uh, trustees uh, behave in a way that you know, the entrepreneur you know, or the settler of the trust is unhappy with, well, he can fire that trustee and he can hire another trustee. I, I like to think of uh, you know, the shareholders of the public company um, if they're not happy with the directors, well, they can elect new boards of directors and fire the old ones, right? So I like to think of it in the same context. So at the end of the day, um, if it, if this is done properly, uh, these uh, substantive these these uh, non CCP structures um, are not uh, and they're not artificial. No uh, skinny shares, right? Shares that have no value but voting control. Um, CRA's commented on that. Um, so we maintain that the proper type of planning that we're referring to does have a place and they can disagree with anything you do. But at the end of the day, um, the planning that we're talking about is not the kind of planning that's been done that has received the harsh criticism and very staunch position by the CRA in relation to this uh, planning that isn't terribly effective. Yeah. So on, the, on that note, did you want to move on to our, uh, our, our case study then? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. 
Ah, okay. Um, Andy, do you want to comment on what's going on here, please? Well, this is one of the, uh, I, guess, I guess, classic examples that we see among many of our clients where they are the operating companies and commingled with other non-active assets or foreign uh, foreign companies within the same uh, trust structure. And the, the main issue with that is obviously uh, the loss of uh, lifetime capital gain exemption uh, on the HOCO shares as uh, the US or here or, or the non-active asset would disqualify uh, those shares to be qualified small business corporation shares. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is this we see all too often. And, you know, oftentimes um, I, I was working with a group of shareholders, uh, some in Israel, and, you know, some, some here in Canada, uh, some in Europe. And we were trying to come up with, you know, a, a structure that made sense. And it kept being the case that, you know, oh, we're going to gravitate back to this whole question. Do we wrong? Is it really worth it? to you know, separate assets. Well, from a Canadian point of view, there's no question about it, you need to. <laughs> uh, in this particular case, the majority of the shareholders were actually European. Um, having said that, one of the things that I think is important enough to talk about is, you know, since we're saying that uh, from a risk point of view, commingling of assets isn't necessarily smart. Like if you have, you know, say as an example, you have various properties within one corporation, well, a brick falls on someone's head in property A, you can lose property B, so it's kind of obvious. Well, from a point of view of a hold code that has, notwithstanding what Andy said, which is very accurate, by the way, um, you may have other reasons. So as an example, there could be dividends that are paid. And in some cases, we see situations where exempt surplus is paid into Canada, where we have controlling-minded management of a company, of a wholly owned subsidiary under, underneath. It might be that you have, uh, what is that, US? Okay, so they're now LLC. By the way, that's a mismatch. Uh, we see that a lot. That's a problem because of the fact that uh, an LLC in the US is uh, considered, uh, well, there's a check the box option where it's treated like a corporation, but under Canadian tax law, it's treated like a partnership, right? So I hope there's no, um, uh, I would say, uh, permanent establishment in the US because there's US branch taxes in LLCs last time I looked, right? Also, you don't have the capability to uh, enjoy the benefits that I described under exempt surplus through an LLC either. There's a whole bunch of reasons, but notwithstanding, the fact is having these companies in different countries all stuck under one whole go is absolutely out of the question. So if that's what your structure looks like, it's time to fix it, okay? So <laughs> uh, the other, all right. So the other thing is, I, I guess from the concept of a trust, one way to protect assets is for you not to own them anymore. So keep in mind the context of trust planning. There's two kinds of owners, right? You have the title owner, whoever owns a legal title, the legal owner, and then you have the beneficial owner. Well, the legal owner is not entitled to any of the assets himself. He must, he has a duty to protect the uh, interests of the beneficiaries, and it's only the beneficiaries that can you know, receive the assets. Now it can be that you know a trustee could be both. A, a trustee and a beneficiary. I mentioned earlier the importance of you doing that to make sure that you know a trust isn't looked at as self-dealing. So the general rule is two trustees are better than one and three is better than two. So I'd say that one great way to protect the assets is for you not to be the beneficial owner anymore. And you can still enjoy the benefits. And you know what? Bringing family, grand uh, children, grandchildren, uh, protecting against uh, the impact of um, a breakdown in a marriage can all be facilitated through this concept very, very nicely. So let's have a look at the solution, if there is one. Jordan, we got another slide on that? Okay, so this is actually, um, Andy, do you want to describe what that is? Well, this slide is, uh, describes uh, what's commonly called a single wing butterfly transaction. Uh, in this example, uh, I imagine Opco is holding excess cash which jeopardize its uh, QSBC status. So one of the solution is to do a single wing butterfly of that cash into a Cisco. So uh, for example, you can pay, Opco can pay a stock dividend of high low shares, meaning high redemption value, low uh, puck uh, on shares uh, to a shareholder 
who can then uh, transfer those high-low shares into a Cisco under Section 85 rollover uh, at the ACB. Um, and, to and then those shares can be redeemed for the cash uh, with the, within the OPCO, uh, thereby transferring the cash from OPCO to Cisco on a tax deferred basis. Yeah. So go back to the other slide for a minute, Jordan, if you don't mind, please. So really what we're talking about doing here in this context is to say, how are we going to move the, you know, those interests, the interest in the LLC, shares in the US T Corp, and well, that's it. I guess I don't really see anything. That, well, oh, hold on, there's a real co. Yeah, it's a real risk. I don't think it could be a problem. Yeah. So one way to do it is to do what Andy just described, which is a section 553A single butterfly. And by the way, I just noticed a question from someone about safe income and safe income calculations. Well, guess what? Uh, where um, the say the issue comes up over uh, safe income, well, it disappears when you do a single wing butterfly. So there isn't a requirement to worry about, you know, dividends um, not being safe income or not when you do a single wing butterfly. So I, I'm going to suggest that, you know, without this, like there's a lot of different tools we have, but this is one of the primary tools. And essentially all it means is you're splitting up assets. You're taking assets of one corporation, you're moving it into another. And you're doing so without any tax whatsoever because of what Andy described. You create cross ownership between the two companies. You have preferred high low shares. You redeem them for cash. You redeem them for shares. You redeem them for whatever asset you want to do, sometimes real estate. Uh, it's really a, a very, very important part of the tax planning arsenal. And uh, it's something that I'm going to say very few. Uh, advisors uh, generally recommend because it's considered too complicated. Maybe it is too complicated, but having said that, it can be done quite easily. <laughs> so um, the reality is, let's talk about not what the tool is, but what the solution is. Go back to the other slide, and we'll talk about the implementation of a strategy such as a single wing butterfly. So in other words, we have these holding companies, and really what we're talking about doing now is to set up really two different holding companies. Well, in this particular case, we've decided for simplicity here, we're just going to take the shares of the USC Corp and the LLC, we're gonna butterfly them over into a brand new hold co, and then we have complete separation, there we we purify hold co. Now to take it a step further, you know, you may wanna consider separating those two. Um, you know, you're working, if you're you know, doing business in the US, it's very litigious, There's, I would be concerned with tax assessments always, and particularly with dividends are, you know, patriated back to Canada. I'd always be worried about a negative tax assessment, and perhaps, uh, you know, tax authorities taking a position, those dividends need to be bought back to the U.S. again. It kind of makes me a bit concerned. Um, having said that, that does happen a lot in Canadian companies. Uh, we we uh, handle a lot of disputes with CRA where, you know, the CRA has gone back over extended periods of time, far, far uh, beyond the statute bar period and have actually said, oh, those dividends need to be taken back because it was trust money that wasn't paid. The dividends were paid instead of the trust money. So I'd say that there's a lot of reasons to be worried about that. Uh, in this context, we have a Barbados trust at the top. And of course, what's important to understand here is that we have all the future growth going there. And in this particular case, we have achieved asset protection that's not available in Canada. If there was a claim, say, in the family court, you know, against the shareholder, and most of the value, say, is in the trust in Barbados, well, there's courts in, the, in Barbados would hear a matter. If there was an order from the court in Ontario, there's reciprocal reciprocity in Barbados. But at the end of the day, the court in Barbados would uh, have no jurisdiction to make an award for assets that are not in Barbados. All they have is shares of a company in a province in Canada, and therefore there's not, not nothing that could be done. So I'm saying that we are also in jurisdictions that are asset protection friendly, if you will. Um, I mentioned Wyoming previously, and the creation of private trust co companies, where you know the private trust company acts as a trustee for a trust in Wyoming, uh, is, is, a, is a very you know, unique solution uh, to some kinds of planning challenges. But either way, you know, this is a situation where we have legitimate control of the of those shares by that trust. And you know what? Uh, you may or may not have um, voting control, 
But if you don't have, well, presumably you can, by through a natural consequence of this plan, you can reduce your tax by as much as 50, both to 50%. Instead of 50.17%, you pay 26 and a half. Now, what we've done here is we've actually been able to create conduits that have been able to go into financial services. So to think about life insurance, it's really important from a number of points of view. Number one, it's a given that when we die, capital gains tax has to be paid. Number two, there's key man issues with the death of a shareholder. Well, there's going to be disruption to a company and a requirement for replacements of capital. You have situations where there's children who are active in a company, some who are not. So life insurance can be used to equalize an estate. It can also be used to create additional estate value that wasn't there previously. But it can also be used personally uh, to achieve some benefits, notwithstanding that. Jordan, do you want to explain how that works if you're able to you use these conduits, and as you flow money through the trust, it ends up over in that sister company, and you, you're buying an insurance policy. How does that work exactly? Oh, yeah, not, yeah, not a problem. Maybe I'll start by just sort of mentioning some of the other sort of inherent, inherent benefits of having uh, life insurance combined with an estate free strategy. Uh, well, I mean, because in, in this structure specifically, many of these assets will not be uh, eligible for the use of the capital gains exemption as. Um, as their uh, U.S. corporations, as well as uh, potentially investment real estate in the case of that, uh, that real estate company. And so having the ability to have funds on hand to be able to pay these capital gains taxes can be very helpful. Although the, the uh, freeze will enable future tax liability to be passed on to the next generation, there will still be the liability on the free share value, on the free shares that the, the current shareholders are holding. And so life insurance can be a very effective strategy to do that. Term life insurance can be effective on a, on a temporary basis, but upon um, the 10 year or 20 year renewal of term life insurance policy it can quickly become very unaffordable for the corporation or, or, or the individual, depending on, on how the life insurance is held. Um, so within the, this structure itself, so this would be depicting either a, a universal life or a whole life permanent life insurance policy that would be held by the sister company. And so um, we're depicting a, a $1 million uh, annual premium. And so depending upon the insurance age of the individual, this might um, result in uh, perhaps a $15 million uh, per, uh, guaranteed death benefit that would be provided to the sister company upon the, the death of the shareholder who would be insured in this case. And the, uh, the structure that we're depicting would involve the life insurance policy and all of its value being used as a collateral assignment to a bank. And at that point, in return for receiving that collateral assignment, banks are willing to issue a loan that is equivalent to the premium that's being paid every single year. So this would be a, a $1 million loan then that would be issued directly to the shareholder of the life insurance, the, 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 the shareholder of the sister company who is also being insured. So each year then this would uh, result in them receiving uh, yeah, one million dollar loan that would not be taxable, as it's as bank loans are not are not taxable in this case. Um, just sort of one detail as well, though, that uh, isn't being depicted here is uh, the need for a guarantee a guarantor fee to be paid from the shareholder back down to the sister company that's a, that's the policy holder of the life insurance policy. And so, generally, um, guarantee fees are are held to be between one percent and one point five percent of the loan that's being issued to them. And so the reason for a guarantor fee is because the sister company is, is acting as a guarantor on behalf of the shareholder to be able to enable them to access this loan. And so um, if you're using a corporate asset to be able to receive a loan personally, this can be viewed as a shareholder benefit under the Section 15.1. And so um, in light of that, there has to be a fee that's paid to the sister company that's uh, generally equal to the marketable benefit that they're receiving. Yeah, so insurance is really a tax product. And I think one of the most misunderstood concepts that I've seen in tax planning, but candidly, I can't even begin to imagine estate planning in the absence of life insurance. Life insurance is one of those things that have a lot of um, sacred uh, statuses, I'd say. In the Income Tax Act, there's no tech tax on death benefits. Money can, can grow and accrue inside of an insurance policy without being subject to tax. I'd suggest that there's a lot of reasons that insurance needs to be used in 
a lot of different reasons. So I'll, I'll move on a little to one final subject that I'd like to talk about, okay? And we talk about risk. Well, one of the things that I've come to realize is that uh, all of the work that we do uh, with assisting companies to position themselves for expansion, oftentimes, we'll, you know, we meet companies that they're looking to create a liquidity event, perhaps issue IPO, go public, perhaps uh, sell the company. And one of the things we see in common is companies are, are looking to grow. And when it comes to the cost of capital, interest rates have doubled. And I dare say that the banks themselves in the, in the approach that they often take, you know, with, with um, particular clients can, in some cases, uh, create additional risks for clients just because of the, the, the cost of, not only the cost of capital, but often because of the accessibility to capital. So as an example, if an individual needs $50 million, well, say the bank gives them, or perhaps let's say they need $100 million. The bank says, okay, we'll give you 50. Well, that's first of all, not the greatest thing. And then the next problem is they have to pay 25 million in, in interest over the next five years. So that means rather than having 100 million, well, all of a sudden the, the entrepreneur only has $25 million and therefore he's at an increased level of uh, issue at risk. We have multi-residential property owners that you know are depending upon a cost of capital where they're highly leveraged. And of course, uh, interest rates uh, they paid before were three, now they're six or seven or eight percent. And there's no way that they're in a position to sustain the portfolio. So one of the things that we're keenly interested in doing is to assist companies that uh, are in that position, that there's, you know, stay somewhere between a minimum of 50 million in multi-residential property. Um, and we've been doing this with, for, for groups that are that have got hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, of multi-res that are leveraged at say 80%, okay, CMHC kind of funding. But we've been able to replace a lot of the capital at much lower cost um, through joint ventures. And this is something that there's opportunities to take advantage of. So whether you're involved with multi-residential real estate or whether or not you're in a business that you believe is scalable and that you can look to enter new global markets, you can get involved with uh, other verticals. You can increase uh, the, va the value of your company. It's very critical that you uh, make sure that your cost of capital is in check and the capital is accessible. So through our a joint venture partner that we deal with, it works with a minimum of 50 million, five zero million. Uh, we're able to assist companies that have the capability to scale to uh, be able to fund their operations. And one of the benefits here is uh, there's 100% financing that's made available. Uh, generally speaking, most of these arrangements work on the following basis is a term loan for either 10 or 15 years with no interest payable for the first five years in most cases. Not only that, but uh, there's no principal repayment until the end of the period, say 10 to 15 years. It is a joint venture arrangement. In other words, um, the Groups that we are uh, have partnered with are providing not only 100% financing, but they're also providing industry captains, you know, over 500 industry captains, top world universities that have resources to be able to help companies to roll out plans that, that are achievable. So this is an area that um, our family office does a lot of work in. And if you are in, uh, have, have a concept that, where you can demonstrate a liquidity schedule, liquidity schedule where you can effectively deploy uh, funds um, in excess of 50 million, five zero, then this might be an area that we could assist with. So I think we've come to a close, it's one o'clock. And as usual, we like to be punctual. Um, I believe we have a few minutes for questions. Jordan, you wanna see if there's any additional questions that have come in? Uh, yeah, we have a few questions here. Um, so there's one question from Val that is asking why safe income is not a concern in the context of purification, let alone any sale contemplation. So I think Bowles was referring to sort of uh, the mention of uh, safe income not being a factor when we're doing a butterfly transaction. Ah, okay. Well, yeah, I agree that it isn't, but uh, part of the question um, it needs to be addressed. So Bell, I would say that um, your question about whether or not safe income is critical from a purification standpoint, 
Well, it is, but it would depend on the methodology that's used to purify a company. So say you have a 112-1 deduction and you're pushing a dividend um, from, uh, say, a hold pro through a trust to a corporate beneficiary, well, you certainly have to be concerned you know, about safe income, it would apply. Um, and, and, the, um, and the purpose test could be certainly applied. Having said that, um, when you, so what I meant was, when I described 55.3a, well, 55.2 doesn't apply. And the purpose test is in 52, 55.2. So 55.3 uh, is effective because where 55.3 applies, 55.2 does not apply. And the very heart of what you're referring to is, at least as far as I think, you're talking about the purpose test in 55.2 being deployed where safe income exceeds a certain amount. Um, I also seen you ask a question, the first question was about calculations for safe income. So yeah, um, we can refer you to somebody that does a lot of safe income calculations, if that would be helpful. I realize there's a shortage of people that do them. Um, we're connected with a couple of people to do. So if we can help out, we're always happy to do that. Any other questions, Jordan? Uh, yes. So, so one question from, from you, Gesh, asking about other passive assets in addition to cash um, in the operating company or, or another company. Um, some of the examples they were giving are real estate or, or cash value life insurance. Yeah, cash value life insurance is a big one, right? You see, the whole problem is we often assist individuals with, you know, various, uh, some of the banks with, you know, the ultra high net worth group. And, you know, when we're asked to come in and look at those situations, like one of the things we see um, right out of the gate is you're using your holding company to make investments. So yes, life insurance, stocks, bonds, marketable securities, real estate that's not active, condos, cottages. I hate putting, co seeing cottages in a corporation as a shareholder benefit. If you're using the cottage personally, <laughs> as one lady said to me, well, all of my friends at my cottage all have their cottages inside corporations. <laughs> so anyway, that's another story. But the fact is, is that at the end of the day, because it's popular, doesn't mean it's wise. There's lots of popular things that aren't wise. So at the end of the day, we want to make sure you're protecting yourself in a way that's uh, really smart. And when you have assets that are not utilized inside of a corporate structure, they will taint the shares of your corporation and you can kiss your capital gains exemption goodbye. That's basically what it means. Yeah. So what we'd like to do is help you to stop doing that. Uh, purification have, uh, strategies. Yeah. So yeah, sorry about that. We also have some hands raised. I think one just from Anna Scourin. Just wanted to, um, I'll, 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 Anna, I'm going to allow you to, uh, to speak as well, just right now, if that's all right. So I've, Hi, so since you had your hand up, I've now uh, allowed you to speak if, you, if you'd like to. Okay, well, yeah, we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, first I'll, I'll uh, in the meantime, I'll make, uh, I'll put, give one quick comment uh, regarding the safe income question. Uh, you still, while doing the single wing butterfly, you still have to make sure that none of the conditions under 553A is triggered. So if you do a single wing butterfly, but then you sell the property or the shares to a third party the next day, then uh, 55 would still most likely apply. Yeah, agreed, Daddy. That's right. So you shouldn't be doing a single wing in contemplation of a sale, right? That's it. So there's another question from Carmelo. Um, asking what would the Barbados Trust be deemed to be a Canadian trust subject to Canadian trust reporting rules? And also, would the Barbados Trust be subject to the 21 year rule? The answer is that the um, Barbados Trust, maybe go back to the other diagram for a second, Jordan. This oh, diagram yeah. doesn't block. Uh, Barbados Trust, under the NERT rules in Section 94 of the Income Tax Act, under the deeming rules, they're deemed to be a non residence trust. They're deemed to be a Canadian trust for the purposes of filing a T3 tax return and computing worldwide income. So the answer is that the Barbados Trust, we're not trying to overcome the very popular hurdle of causing it to be a foreign trust, absolutely not. We are agreeing that the trust is, an, is a Canadian trust, all right? That is the fundamental difference in planning. What was the second part of the question, please, again? So it was asking about, um... Would the Barbados Trust be subject to the 21-year rule? 
which I think absolutely, is, yeah, as a Canadian trust, hundred percent. Now in Barbados, uh, the trusts, you know, uh, they don't have the same legislation, but the legislation in Canada would apply to the shares of the Barbados Trust, correct? Sure. And I'm just going back to Anna again. Anna has uh, raised her hand again. So Anna, if you want to just unmute yourself, then uh, you can voice your question. Hi, Anna. Okay, perhaps there might be a problem then on that on that side. So yep. um, maybe we'll just go on to a question then from Robert. So um, Robert ha has asked, what is the CRA's position on the 553A single wing butterfly for the purposes of purification dividend only as a part of a series of purification steps immediately prior to a sale? Ah, well, uh, my guess is, is, is that Robert asked that question before Andy provided the caution, right? So yes. it's important. And, and the problem with a series of transactions, I'm going to just make it very simple. And that is that we have, there's case law that supports the series of transaction has virtually no time bounds either, you see. So one of the things that is very important to understand is where does it happen where you're in contemplation? So what does contemplation mean? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that if you have an offer on the table, well, it's too late to consider doing a single wing butterfly. So I don't know if that helps, Robert, but that's my, my view at least. Uh, I would also add to that um, in order for the purification to work, uh, you have to still have to satisfy the QSBC requirements. So namely at the point of sale, uh, it should be 90% active and has to be 50 or 90, depends on, on the structure, uh, active for 24 months. So if you if you do it immediately before, most likely you wouldn't meet the 24 month test. That's true too. Absolutely. And so there are a couple other people that raised their hand as well. Um, let's find them. Okay, I think the only person raising their hand still is Anna. So Anna, I'll just give you one more chance if you wanted to ask your question. Just one more. <laughs> hey Anna, are you there? <laughs> I think there might be a, a technical problem <laughs> of sorts. Um, does anyone else have any other questions that they'd like to ask? Oh, I think there's another question. That, okay, I think that's everyone then that's voiced a, a question then on the chat side. And so I think we've asked all the questions then. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. All, right. all right. Well, that's been fun as always. More tax fun than we can almost handle. So very nice oh. to uh, be together with, with everyone. Well, Val has asked, has asked to raise his hand and, and voice a question. So I will allow you to, uh, to do that if you'd like to, Val. Yeah, thank you. It's always uh, interesting to hear from you guys. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Todd, I do, I do understand the 112 deduction. The, the, the confusion has been with the, say, ever since Plus Dover case came out, uh, it, it seems to suggest that even though the Income Tax Act allows a purpose test, you still have to go through the results test. So the case went to FCA and FCA ruled that you still be subject to a results test. So it's my understanding that whenever you're doing a, a purification, um, I mean, a reliance solely on purpose test might not be uh, might not be uh, a criteria that CRA will follow through. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the act doesn't say that, uh, but following plaster mayor, I mean, like we're basically stuck. I mean, that's that's my observation. But if you have anything else, mm -hmm. please let us know. Yeah, I mean, I'm anxious to see what happens, and, and you know, also to my knowledge, I haven't seen CRA starting to enforce the purpose test. Have you? Well, what, what I have not personally seen, but in my practice, what I've seen is that, um, you know, in more standard vanilla scenarios where there's lumpy dividends and things like that, we clearly know that it, it's not even going to mean anything. But mm -hmm. generally, we always do a, a safe income calculation and then give a little bit of a, 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 a you know, a margin uh, where we think there might be a 55 two that might apply. And the rationale yeah. is because, you know, safe income has not been defined well enough, right? It's not a prescriptive calculation. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, an, it's an evolution for every one of us. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. And, and, and I guess that's why my preference is to do a 55-3A rather than, uh, you know, saying, okay, we're going to pay, we're going to get a 112-1 deduction. So I, I quite favor, you know, going for a route that says we're taking the risk off the table where possible. Now, having said that, I agree with you. Safe income tests should be done. 
Companies need to track their safe income. They need to know, they need to have a dividend policy too. They need to be able to determine, you know, how much cash, because cash is a non-active asset. If you have more than what's needed to run your business, well, how much cash we keep on hand. So I'm thinking that a safe income uh, calculation is necessary for every company. And I'm also of the belief that uh, a dividend policy is very important to have soundly in place for asset protection and for tax efficiency. So that's uh, that's usually the advice we give. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, just a very quick, uh, again, a very quick question or a clarification. Um, in 553A, I mean, like, uh, there's still a value shift, right? I mean, the, the, there's a there's an asset shift from one entity to the other. Mm -hmm. So how, how are we actually still escaping the uh, safe income part there? Well, it's simply put that the uh, legislation is such that where the, there's an application okay. of it. Yeah, okay, I, I get it, I get yeah. it. Yeah, I, I, yeah. You're relying on the exceptions to 553A. Uh -huh. But uh, when you do- well, 553A is clearly stated that doesn't, that 552 doesn't apply if 553A applies, you see. Yeah. So it's not uh, as though we're relying on an exception. We're relying on- Correct, uh, but that exception mm -hmm. fails if you're in a contemplation of a sale or anything like that. So I just want to- Yeah, it say. does fail in contemplation of a sale, you're right. And that I think is something that we can't underestimate the importance of. So yeah, I think, I think that it's, much. yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And so maybe I'll come back to you just one more time, Anna, if you'd like to, uh, if you're able to unmute yourself and voice your question. Okay, perhaps Anna's having a problem. But um, just, for, just for anyone else, if you have any additional questions, yeah, please uh, feel free to give us a call or, or give us an email and we'd be happy to uh, schedule a time with you to, to speak further. And uh, Anna, I think that you've managed to unmute yourself now. Yeah, no, no, no question. Yeah. Hi there, Anna. Yeah, hi. Okay. Anna's so, hands up, but you're muted, I think. No, no, they don't, have, they don't have any other questions, so that's fine. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, thank you very much to everybody. Um, look forward to another session uh, sometime next month. Is that right, Jordan? It is, yeah. So, it's, so we'll be having a, an invitation circulated just over the next uh, the next few days. Just that we'll be uh, we'll confirm the date of our next the date and subjects discussed in our next program. Okay. Thank you, fellow hosts and audience as well. And we, we'll talk again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.